Hello, hello, everybody. It is 2.33 p.m. Central Time on the 8th of December, 2020. It's Tuesday here in the United States. It's been a day since I did my last update, jumping on to do a little rundown on seismic activity. And if you're a new viewer here, let me just quickly explain. We're using Earthquake 3D, the program, and we're using the full version, which allows you to combine feeds we are combining the USGS and the EMSC out of Europe, looking at 48 hours worth of earthquakes. So let me get a display capture turned on here. If I could press the right button, there we go. Okay, so we're looking at 48 hours worth of earthquakes and the earthquakes that are raised high off the globe are deep down into the earth. These are deep earthquakes happening down below the plates in an area called the asthenosphere which is just a complex term to describe the magma down below the plates. Now I'm going to show you something here really quick, which I'm going to reference throughout the rest of this update, and this is the USGS plate boundary map. You can just get it on their regular USGS earthquake site. This is the past day's worth of earthquakes from the USGS on their website, 2.5 and greater. What we're interested in looking at are the red lines or the boundaries between the plates. You'll have to remember all of these red lines, which I'm going to show you throughout the update. You don't have to memorize them. And we're going to compare that to the arrows that we have on the maps here. For instance, going across the United States or going across Europe, that the USGS does not have anything, for instance, going across the United States or anything red line wise going across Eastern Europe. The reasons we have arrows there, well, we're looking across the edges of the cratons, and that's plural. For instance, the United States edge of the craton there. Or over in Europe, the edge of the craton going over to the east. It's an S-shaped bend across Eastern Europe. We can also go down into Australia. And the craton that comes down into Central Australia, and the green versus the brown, basically. And that gets us into the current earthquakes that have struck in the last two days since my last update. I'll start right here where the deep earthquake is, raised high off the globe. So a deep 5, 5.4, has come rolling in down several hundred kilometers down below the plate. Whenever something like this happens, we have to watch for a shallower, larger earthquake or series of earthquakes to spread out from the deep earthquake location. Now the deep earthquake location has a letter D on it. It's a spot where we watch for new deep earthquakes to occur. And let me show it to you on the red line map here from the USGS. Right at the pinnacle tip next to Fiji, we have our letter D here. And leveraging force or power comes in from the underside of the plate here and comes up, out, and away from where the deep earthquakes are hammering in, like I said, from the magma down below up into the underside of the plate. Now, here's a graphical representation of what I think is going on in a wave pool. Concentric waves forming in on each other in the fluid of the magma can't compress in the fluid and are forced up into the underside of the plate. In other words, there's waves going through the magma down below, and those waves are hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles long, VLF, very low frequency. So those hundreds of miles long wave, or, or bigger, longer, are hammering in, focusing in on a point on the underside of the plate, and then something else I think is happening it forms into a standing wave. The more hammering action there is, in other words, the more of this that's going on on the underside of the plate, the more of these that form and spread out from the plate. And these are standing waves. Now in the tank, they don't get disorganized and jostle around. They actually organize, and as you pump more energy in on either end of this, or on both ends, that that puts more power or more amplitude into the wave and it gets bigger. Now the spacing on these waves is significant because I can just park my mouse over the peak of one and you'll see the valley fills in the peak as it spreads. So each peak fills in the previous point's valley, if you will, or each middle point. Now that matters because then there's a spread going out from this hammer point here where the deep earthquakes are hammering in of same sized earthquakes spreading out all the way around and down. Let me show you what it's spreading through. See the red line? Think of this like the tank that I just showed you in the laboratory, where the force is going down and then traveling over. Well, that's the trajectory our earthquakes took. And look, they're all about the same size. I'm showing you everything 2.5 and greater. 
well, at least reported by the USGS and EMSC. And it's pretty obvious we have a 4.6 up here to the north of New Zealand, North Island, right in the middle of our warned area. And we have a 4.6 all the way down here on the southwest point of the Dutch Sense logo, which is really just on the fracture zone in the middle of nowhere. Now, in between the two, we have a 5 or a 4.9 right down where the bend is. See where our letter X is down at the bend. X marks the spot. It's where the two plate boundaries come together. And we see energy develop up here, go down, across, and over around Australia in two directions, to the north and to the south. Now, this is the Indo-Australian plate, and last week we saw the whole thing displace all the way around the entire outside edge, even all the way over across the South Pacific, over to the South Sandwich Islands, following these fracture zones. This whole thing displaced last week. Additionally, up to the north this past week, deep 6.4, which we're pretty much at the tail end of the 6.4 warning. Now we have a big solar storm coming in, level G3, which I just posted on my YouTube page. You guys can go see the NASA NOAA warning from that, talking about geomagnetic storm anomalies, including power line disruptions, Aurora Borealis coming down as far as Iowa, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. All due by the 10th. Today is the 8th. 9th, starting tomorrow, low-level solar storm, level G1. And then by the 10th, level G3, which is considered severe or strong. Or strong is the word. Okay, so we have a spread of earthquakes all about the same size going down and around South Australia. And look what happened up to the north. 4.6. 4.8 here, let me mark it in blue, and another 4.6. So 4.6, 4.8, 4.6, and 4.6, 4.9, 4.6, going in two directions around the plate, and then sandwiched in the middle of it all, a new 5, 5.1. And one more time, let's reference the red lines here. Around this way, down south of New Zealand and over to the west, and around Australia over to the northwest. All the same size. Okay, so, Aussies, you guys, you guys have been moving Perth, down near Perth, over next to Uluru, and up to the east-northeast, around the outside edge of the yellow here, where the yellowish tan meets the green. Multiple cratons make up Australia, and it's obviously going around the outside edge. I'm still expecting movement down by Adelaide, or Tasmania, Adelaide, I'd say between Adelaide and Tasmania. So if we come in right down here at the south tip, don't fault me. No pun intended. The last time we warned Adelaide and Kangaroo Island right here got hit right next to Adelaide. So that was pretty close. Uh, up to the north, check this out. Man, if you were keeping track of areas that we warned, first of all, odd event happened here. See this 5.4? USGS has it at 5.4. Everybody else had it at like 6 point something. I don't know what to make of it. There's even reports coming out of China, even, where they're referencing Philvox, which is the agency that handles all the seismic for Philippines, bringing it in at the six ring. So I made a post on it. Uh, here, you know what? Let's just go over to my YouTube page. Go over to my community page, see if it's still there. Did I delete it? Or <laughs> Oh, there it is. 6.4 earthquake struck yesterday in the Philippines. USGS downgraded to five-ish range. Here's the news from China. And they're referencing Manila and, and Philvox. So, or five, wait, five volks. Five volks, <laughs> whatever. Okay, so they have the time, they have the depth, they have the distances triangulated, and they have it at 6.4. Preliminary magnitude 6.4. And USGS 5.4. Why does that matter? Why would the USGS downgrade an earthquake to 5.4 when it's clearly a 6.4? Now, hold on. Let me just remind everybody. In case you don't know, a couple days ago, well, here, let me see if it's still on the feed here. Uh, let's take it back six days. Nope, okay. So seven days ago, there was a big, deep 6.4 right down below the area north of Japan or up here by Russia. So in between Japan and Russia, west of the Kurils. Big, deep 6.4, which was then followed within a, of an hour, two hours later, a 6.3 to 6.4 earthquake that struck down here in Chile, which was then struck the next morning by a 6.4 earthquake up here in the Aleutians. So it was three 6.4 earthquakes. Now, I issued a warning down to the south, and I specifically mentioned Philippines to Taiwan, 
right down here is the southernmost point where the ring spread out to from the big deep 6.4 you can go back and watch my video from YouTube uh, last week seven days ago so this was the warned area and we warned for something 6.4 or greater now all of a sudden central Philippines right on the edge of the warned area a 6.4 hit now there's something else weird going on people talking about China and reporting of a large earthquake series of large earthquakes that have happened in the past week here in China there's no seismic activity being reported out of this area so that would be two areas one of which they downgraded crazy in Philippines the other they're just not reporting two areas that I warned and this is like many people contacting me about the reports in China I don't know what to make of that I really don't so did earthquake activity take place in China well look what's going on around China so for instance down to the south see this 5.1 in Myanmar see where the arrow is now let's just jump back over and take a look at the USGS plate boundary map right here look where the plate boundary goes the red line goes right up through Myanmar makes a bend to the west and our warned area was right here in China central China now something else happened over here to top it all off Barren Island erupted let's zoom in on it see if it comes up on the name well maybe I need to turn on the terrain maybe is this it ah look you can't even zoom in on it to get the name okay well let, let's go over here and show it to you this way Barren Island is right here where the two rings overlap and we can actually even go over to the volcanic ash advisory center and just see if it's on the list for today still I, I know it was on last night there it, oh, I mean, it's top on the list now see how it says India India technically owns these waters or uh, possession of these islands here so this is considered technically India but anyway right east of there barren island is suddenly erupting and we don't normally see it on the list hardly at all 6,000 foot eye blast not that big but still to see anything from there it's the middle point it's the fulcrum point between the two sets of quakes now look at where the other sets of rings overlap they overlap directly on Mount Cinnabung which erupted this past week sorry I didn't mean to hit the microphone there hold on let me adjust this okay got to get it out of the way I'm gonna have to get a stand for it okay sorry guys unprofessional now look here across the giant open silent zone that middle point that's where Mount Semeru put off a 50,000 foot high blast just a few days back right here in the middle so middle point volcano there middle point volcano there middle point volcano there and all three have erupted in the past week now if we go down the list the volcanic ash advisory center list we're going to see all of our usual suspects so like Popocante Patal, Ducono, Sanjay, Ruivetador, Fuego, Kluchevskoy up in Kamchatka, Suenizajima now I'm just looking for any new eruptions and Barren Island came on last night so that's the new one Ebeko, Ebeko up at the Kuril Islands next to Kamchatka and going down the list again tell oh Talika volcano Talika Talika in Nicaragua and that wraps it up going into a day ago so in other words we have another new volcano that's on the list that doesn't normally show up and it's a 6,000 foot eye blast you got to remember what's happened at all these others that just show up with 6,000 foot eye blast and then like a day later we're reporting on a 50,000 foot eye blast Luatolo right here for instance hadn't erupted significantly at all since 2012 it had been eight years then it showed up with like a 5,000 foot eye blast then within a couple days 50,000 foot eye blast then the next day another 50,000 foot eye blast the one I just mentioned at Mount Semeru this has all happened this past week and that takes us up into China and Asia Nepal got hit 4.2 let's go back over to the red line map one more time going up and around the bend in Myanmar here let's turn back on the grayscale view for easy identification look where it goes it goes right through Nepal and look where the earthquake is it's right on the red line where we have it here going over to the west now look at Iran on both sides of Iran 4.5 to the south and 4.3 to the north back behind it a 4.9 or a 5 so think of it like this first this 5 struck then this 4.3 
then this 4.5. Let's go back to the red line map. Look, 5 up here, 4.5 down here on the other red line. And up here to the north, USGS has zilch. They don't have anything there. The reason we have an arrow there, I have to show you on Google Earth. Let's go all the way over to Iran. I've shown this so many times, but we're showing it for new people. Here is Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And I'm going to turn off the borders just so you can see this. Looks like a flowing river. That's down to the south, right? Down to the south, the USGS has the red line plate boundary. But we have an arrow up to the north. Why? Look, it flows like a river up to the north and around the center block of the Craton here in all of the Middle East. So the mountain ranges flowing like molasses over a long period of time are being pushed or con converted, contorted, or being twisted by the seismic force, which is going around the central block of the Craton. So we have an arrow up to the north because seismic flow goes across there. Hence the earthquakes up right across it on the edge. Now down to the south, we get about the same size. And the spot where we struck down to the south is nothing but a bunch of lacoliths, bulges in the plate from magma right down here. So we can zoom in and start to find them. Some of them are older, some of them are younger. Here, here's an old one. See the circular feature here? It's actually collapsed. This is a ridge that goes down. But at one point, this was raised up. Now we can find one that's younger, that's still rising, for instance, like right here. So this is actually like a rising, bulging dome. There. Now, eventually, that will rupture like one of the others over to the east or up to the north, where they actually rupture and flow out. You can see the flow-like nature on this. And it could be like a muddy-type mixture that comes out of there. It might even be like a mud volcano that wells up there. But also, magmatic contents are included because over to the east, you can see where they've flowed out and made like a stone-like piled up low viscous or a viscous so very thick flow that comes out of there and it doesn't flow very far others collapse and they leave what look like magmatic contents on the surface this one again is a collapsed basin now but it rose up in the past here's another one here's another one here's another one they go right down to the coast and out into the ocean Okay, so they're all along the edge here, and they go over to the west following the red line. Let's go back to the red line map from the USGS map. There. Now look where it goes. It goes up into Turkey, where it dead ends into Turkey, and then it makes a W-shaped bend across South Mediterranean or Central Mediterranean, and it goes into Italy, where it dead ends up into the Swiss Alps, right? Then the plate boundary goes out to the west and dead ends into the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, like a dead-end road that goes, well, a T-intersection road. So the seismic force is flowing across this, and look at the earthquakes. Watch this. Here, let me turn down the ring so you can even see. Coming out of Turkey, it's following it like a road, and look who got hit. 5.3 earthquake in the past two days, past 48 hours. Back on the, or fifth, three days ago. Three days ago, right on the edge of our warned area, the 5.3 struck. Let's get that out of there. There we go. Here's everything since the 5.3. A new 4.6 at Albania, right on the east side of Italy. Central Italy started to move with two sets of twos. A deep four happened down below the Tyrrhenian Sea, prompting me to issue the warning for any new large activity to pop up around the deep earthquake. And then that 4.6 struck right after it, like six hours later. Or maybe it was 12 hours. Let's see. This struck at 150 UTC on that day, a day and a half ago. And then after that, Wait for it to refresh. After that, at, come on now, 719, yeah, six hours later. So first the deep four happened, then next to it, over to the east, right on our arrow, another larger earthquake struck. Since then, a bunch of twos broke out on the north side up here, and a three right next to Florence, which the USGS ignored. And the Europeans reported it was a 3.3 right next to Florence. Now out to the west, 4.7, a near 5, has struck out here on the red line. But wait a second, that 4.7, let's just get the information from the... Is that the Europeans who have that, or they both have it? I think Europeans and the USGS both have this quake. No, hold on. The USGS does not have this earthquake. It struck at 1635 UTC today, 
It's now 2052. It's a 4.7, and it's right on the red line here. See this jagged edge line west of Gibraltar? That's where our new 4.7 is. Why doesn't the USGS have this on their site? Let's go over to their main page. Latest earthquakes. Back it out. Go over to Europe. Yeah, they don't have jack squat, and it's a 4.7. Let's just make sure we've got the right feed turned on. 4.5 plus all U.S. and international. And they do cover smaller earthquakes. So, I mean, I can prove that to you if you need me to prove that to you. Let's just show you. They do cover smaller earthquakes. Uh, what, what's this one? 4.5 over in Iran, for instance. <laughs> I mean, so they cover smaller earthquakes internationally. 4.6 over in Indonesia. A 4.4 down in Chile. A 4.1 in Peru. They, these are USGS reported quakes, guys. So there's no excuse to, to omit the 4.7 here off the western coast of Gibraltar or southwest coast of Portugal. Now, why would they do that? Well, guess what struck first? The other fours over to the east. It, look, it's a 4.6 to 4.7 over in Albania. Right there, right on the little arrow. It's another 4.6 to 4.7 right here on our other arrow. So it's two of the same sized earthquakes spreading out across the plate after this big deep four. Which, by the way, USGS reported this. Look. It's just a four. They've got a four over in Italy. So why wouldn't they have a 4.7 right over on the edge? Because it proves my case. And they're all about hiding that. They said it couldn't happen, that's why. Now, let's go out here, look, directly between our two X's. Another same-sized earthquake. 4.8. Now, guess what? If we take this 4.7, plus this 4.6 over in Albania, all the way over here, we get 4.86. You could round it up to a 4.9, or just keep it at a 4.8. Either way, it's the same size. And this is the fulcrum point between the two X's. Look at the bend in the plate, how it goes out west of Iceland. Let me show it to you this way. Here. So between this point and this point, a middle point sorted out, Mother Nature sorted it out, where the peak or the valley of the wave reached the highest point here, or the lowest point, which caused the earthquake. Like in the wave tank again. That the spread on that is thousands of miles between wave height, wave peak, and wave valley. Where wave, maybe this is the peak, and this is the peak, and this is the valley in between. Or, this is the peak, and there's two valleys on either side. Either way, the wave is spreading out across the whole region, dropping off the same-sized earthquakes all the way from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, down to the Gibraltar Straits, over to the west to Albania. Let's look at it on the USGS map. Going from here, down to here. Wait. From here, down to here. And over to here. All of this just shifted on the same basis in a day and a half, maybe two days time. So why is the USGS ignoring that? Wouldn't you say that a 4.8 out here next to our two X's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge sounds an awful like, lot like our 4.8 down here next to our letter X in Africa? It's too slightly distant from the X, but it's the perfect trajectory and the perfect amount it's the same sized activity spreading out across the whole planet. Remember, we were talking about 4.6, 4.8, 4.9 down here at the South X, down south of New Zealand. It can't be a coincidence. It's too many spots where it's all the same. Oh yeah, up north of Japan, 4.8 as well. Now let's jump all the way across. We'll talk about Hawaii in a second, but we have to talk about South America. So, a significant-sized earthquake struck here. 6.1, 6.2 earthquake struck. North Chile. Since then, let's look at everything that struck since the 6. Let's get that out of there. It's just a day ago that it hit, but there. So, there is a spread starting to go down across the coast of Chile. Two days ago, right here, maybe three days ago, Nevado de Chilean started to erupt. Right at our tip of our arrow at the Chile-Argentina border. A new 5.0 earthquake next to it, and a spread of earthquakes between the 6 and the 5. And again, they're virtually equally spaced. Here, let me zoom in on them so you can see them. Where one ring overlaps the other as the force is spreading out in two directions from the shift 
Now the big arrow down here to the south points into the middle point, basically, that got hit. Up to the north, the same thing happened. An earthquake came across the big arrow right by Leviathan there and hammered into South America right at the tip of the arrow. Fulfilling our warning for Panama, Colombia. Nevados del Ruiz volcano started to erupt in here, as well as Sanjay and Reventador going down here in Ecuador. New earthquakes in Ecuador and Peru. Sabancaya erupting, and like I said, Nevados de Chilean erupting. So that's a fair amount of eruptive activity. Then right up here to the north, see all this seismic activity here? Look where it is. It's at Costa Rica and Nicaragua. So, actually, we're in Costa Rica mainly. But Nicaragua... Telica volcano, Telica, erupting in Nicaragua to the north side. Now it's pretty much all centered right across. Well, actually, hold on. It's going into Panama even. So normally we're up here on the north side. And a five point something earthquake struck next to Telica volcano. It's marked in pink here from a couple days ago. But now that that earthquake struck, it shifted down to Costa Rica. Turrialba volcano has not erupted in, I haven't seen it on the list in a long time. So Turrialba Volcano might go with the seismic activity on both sides of it. And look at the size. 4.7 to 4.8 again. And a 4.5 to 4.6. With the 5.1 right down where it came hammering in where the big arrow points. Up to the north, the biggest earthquake of the day for Central America. Right on the coast of Mexico. 5.4. But we have to go back a few days and you don't see any earthquakes up here marked to the north. But... I'm here to tell you, USGS has been ignoring 4.0 range earthquakes in Mexico, too, just the past few days, even. We had fours going down the Gulf of California. I even made a comment about it in my video two days ago, and somebody left a comment on YouTube. Gulf of California? I've never heard of that. Like, they were shocked to hear there's something called the Gulf of California, and I left a comment for him. I go, yeah, it's not just the Gulf of Mexico, dude. The Gulf of Mexico is over here. The Gulf of California is over here. <laughs> Look up your geography, right? But anyway, somebody said something about it on YouTube even. But now, here we are, and no earthquakes. Again, the USGS not reporting those over the past. And we're looking at here. Look at the last six days. Look what they've got. One quake out there. One. And we know there's been way more. So this is the halfway point between our previous sets of 4.0 range earthquakes, by the way. And it's also the halfway point between Popocate Patal Volcano that's erupting here, where our letter V is, and eruptions down at Fuego, and actually, we can even add in Pacaya Volcano right there in Guatemala. So the halfway point between the two volcanoes that have been erupting, plus the halfway point between the earthquakes, got hit with the biggest earthquake of the bunch so far, which is 5.4. Now let me go back to the USGS map. Where the 5.4 struck here, and a 5.1 struck here. Gee, where do they meet? They meet on both sides of what is the edge of the Caribbean plate. Central America going over to the Caribbean plate. 5.4 to the north, 5.1 to the south. Over to the east, we're going to see a big increase here in the next couple days. This is like a giant flood that was just dropped by a huge rainstorm, and the river is flowing pretty much two directions, but in the same general direction overall, which is over to the east. So think of these like storms, think of these like rivers. And they're both going to meet over here on the east side of the Caribbean. And now I think we need to issue a warning right now. A terremoto warning, an earthquake warning for the people over here east of Puerto Rico and north of Venezuela. It's a pretty big area. Actually, let's see how many hundreds of miles that is. Like a 400-mile stretch. One, two. From this island to this island. So four to 500 mile area we have to warn in the Eastern Caribbean for the potential of larger earthquake activity, larger than 5.5 over the next several days. Now, I would like to also tell the people in Puerto Rico with a 5.5 coming in right next to you, this past week, the biggest we went was four, which is good. Last week, we were looking for 5.0 range activity and the highest it went was the four range. So let's hope I'm off by a magnitude like I was last week. But where did the energy go? Last week, the energy spread out across Dominican Republic, Haiti, south of Cuba, back to the Cayman Islands. So you got a spread of fours, basically, or upper threes to fours. I think it was Cayman Islands was the biggest. But it was a spread going across the red line across 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles. This time, I think this is going to be 
focusing in on the east edge of the plate and go out towards our letter X's over in the mid-Atlantic, which barely got hit last week at all, which means there's a lot of energy trapped between these two 5.0 5 range earthquakes over here on the western side of Central America and the eastern edge of the plate boundary over in the eastern Caribbean. So a lot of tension between here and here, and I think it's going to break over here on this side. Based upon past transfer, I mean, it's flowing. It's flowing like a river. Central America has gone quiet across Peru, which is kind of odd. You would normally expect some activity where the rings overlap, which means that eh, we might want to keep an eye on Peru just in case for a release to take place. That's also fairly large. Another midway point down here in South Chile, it's been noticeably quiet. That's down by Bio Bio Chile, noticeably quiet. I'm not issuing a warning for that right now, though. Okay, so let's get into the continental United States. We'll start up here in the North Pacific, coming out of the Aleutians, where our 5.0 range activity from a couple days ago, right here, right on the red line of the plate boundary. Again, I told you I was going to be referencing that for the rest of the update. The earthquakes follow that. And once they get up into North America, or Laurentia, this is the plate of Laurentia, it gets absorbed in the edge of the plate, off the red line. And it goes into the plate, following the craton edge, trying to make a path of least resistance around it to go around over to the north. And instead of trying to go brute force through the central point of the plate, this seismic force, whatever it is, goes around the plates like a wave guide, which makes me think we're talking about some kind of very low frequency of some kind. But that gets into something else entirely. What's causing it? Uh, core of the Earth. Anyway, spread of waves goes across... Again, think of it like the wave tank, where this wave is spreading across the wave tank. But when it gets to the edge of North America, it gets absorbed by the plate. And, well, at least it tries to. And you can see where it focuses in. This is the last two to three days worth of quakes. It's a big increase. Think of this like all those waves sloshing into the edge of the tank, which goes up to Mount Denali. The highest point in North America right there. Let me show it to you on Google Earth. Up here. There it is. So getting over oh, here, let me bring this back due north. There, okay. So coming in from Anchorage, we go up here on the north side. Here is Mount Denali. Denali National Park and Preserve, formerly Mount McKinley, but there it is. And it's on the bend of the edge of the plate. But to see it, I guess I need to turn off all my place marks. The bend in the edge of the plate here, which goes down to the south and meets in with the Rockies. And, of course, over on the eastern edge, we are on the edge of the Craton. And you can see it going down through Canada, down in the United States. The, ed the interior edge of the Craton, where the mountains go into the plains. So, the earthquakes follow that. First, they come off the thick red line that I've been showing you the whole update, which is the plate boundary. Gets absorbed into the plate and it jumps off like a ramp right up into it, which absorbs a lot of the energy. Over here... Silicate sand deposits are being upwelled out of the plate, pushed up itself out of the plate, kind of like the accumulation of white sands Alamogordo, New Mexico on the edge of the plate. <laughs> they tell us that's from wind. I don't buy that. Here, let me go sip my coffee. Up to the east-northeast on the northern slopes of Alaska, 3.7, the biggest of the bunch, and that's over east of all of our oil pumping operations. Here's the Arctic Circle. Right on the shores, starting over here, we have a bunch of oil pumping going on. This gets into the story of HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Re Wait, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. I almost said project. Okay, the program was first designed to use high frequency from a base station somewhere down here. They didn't have the site yet, but the idea was to use high frequency to generate plasma up in the upper ionosphere. So pulse high frequency radio waves from a powerful transmitter up into a point in the sky that they focus in a few kilometers across. That high frequency pulsing excites the upper ionosphere and moves electrons, basically, heat. And it starts to do air glow like the northern lights does with the sun when it bombards the ionosphere itself from the sun. But it's a targeted area, a few kilometers across. And it's plasma up in the upper ionosphere, 
caused by high frequency radio waves. Now the idea was to create that plasma and then turn it like a dish and reflect the plasma creating VLF, very low frequency, from the plasma, which is many kilometers across, like a big bass drum speaker basically, and to point it down at the ground. Turn it and point it by modulating the radio waves from the ground base station using high frequency. So using high frequency, creating plasma up above, up in the ionosphere up here, to then vibrate many miles wide back down, sending a wave that penetrates into the crust, which then they use on the northern slopes of Alaska to look for large oil deposits in the ground because the VLF, like a radar almost, bounces off that and comes back up. So, they built HARP originally to look for oil deposits in the northern slopes. Once the military got wind on that, they actually donated their former over-the-horizon radar designated build site to have HARP built, and they figured out they could also use it to look for underground bunkers, missile silos, and you know, God knows what. So then it became an experimental facility, HARP did, where they figured out they could do all kinds of things. Uh, well, and that gets into the whole conspiracy about HARP, which I'm not going to get into there, but that's the original Dr. Bernard Eastland came up with those patents for using an area up here, uh, again, high-frequency transmitter, to generate plasmas, to create VLF, to penetrate the ground, to look into the Earth. Okay. So, oh, by the way, and we go right up there, right on the northern slopes, and there's a bunch of small earthquakes where I think they could still be doing that with another facility, maybe, or there may be a smaller version, maybe even HARP itself. Now, no earthquakes across the entire coast of Canada of any significance reported by the USGS. Now, that doesn't mean there's not earthquakes, double negative, but properly used. So there still are earthquakes likely taking place here, and the Canadian agency may or may not be reporting them on the NR Canada site. Regardless, there is no 30-day feed, 20-day feed, 10-day feed, 7-day feed for me to put on any program since they have a 30-day static feed on their site with no feed available to the general public that you could use in another program. Okay, so NR Canada's behind the times, whatever. If anything big strikes, supposedly the USGS will report it, but I already showed you the USGS is omitting earthquakes down in Mexico in the 4.0 range. So they're likely omitting earthquakes in the 4.0 range up here between Alaska and Canada. Now, the only reason I think that is because coming out of this area, we have a lot of seismic activity that comes out of the area, but going into the area, they don't report jack... Well, it's the third time I've said it, <laughs> this update. Jack squat, they don't report it. Now, starting right on the shores, they do. And in Washington, for instance, up here at the Olympic Peninsula, going down along the coast, we're going to need to go look all of these earthquakes up. But first, let's go turn on our 24-hour earthquake feed. So 24 hours, last day, 0.0. .0. And we'll get into Hawaii, too, in just a little bit for my Hawaiian viewers. Because things are still moving in Hawaii. And they're starting to pick up, aren't they? Now that the solar storm's going to be arriving, I'd say we need to watch even more. But, okay, 24 hours worth of earthquakes. Here's 0.0, .0 and greater. All that's happened here is we've removed a few from the coast yesterday. Those were earthquakes, not explosions. But now, today, here right at the Oregon-Washington border, let's just go see, because we are right on the back side of our arrow. And we're right at the front side of the arrow. Look at that. Front tip of the arrow getting hit. Back side of the arrow getting hit. It's the way power or energy transfers in on the edge of the craton. Just basic stuff. It's coming out of the Juan de Fuca. Let's show it to you on the USGS map now. These are like arrows on the Pacific Plate itself. Pacific Plate shifting, transferring energy along the red lines. Energy comes into the edge of the plate up here in the northwest, starts to get absorbed. It also starts to get absorbed down here at the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone, where it then transfers into and up into the plate. comes from down below and goes up into the plate. So wait a second. If that's the path, that the energy takes, and it is, that's the way the earthquakes all go, even interior to the Craton into Montana and Yellowstone even. It's a perfect match. Look at the equal spacing of quakes going down into Yellowstone Park along the edge of the Craton. Perfect match. 
Now back over here again, the arrows hit on both sides. What about the 1.2? Let's go see. Amboy Washington. Are they connected? What's at Amboy Washington? Anybody know what's at Amboy? Bueller? Bueller? Let's turn on my place marks while it's zooming in. Might cause a freeze here temporarily, but you see this white splotch up here on the north side? Uh oh, hold on. We have a hot spot right here. We'll get into that in a second. See this white splotch? That's not a splotch, that's a mountain. Mount St. Helens with its rising dome out of the center. We're right on the flank of it. Again, our earthquake is coming in here, but what is this? When did this happen? September 10th, there was a hot spot right there. Three months ago, a hot spot in that location. I have to remember where the hot spots are because, they're, well, again, you get a hot spot next to a volcano. you got to mark those. This time, the earthquake is coming in next to Mount St. Helens, though. It's on the flank. We were in the crater a couple weeks ago. No, more than a couple weeks ago. Like four weeks ago, we were in the crater. Now we're on the outside edge of the volcano. Now, wait a second. What's over here? This cluster of quakes in central Idaho. Let me show you on Google Earth. Here is Idaho, and we'll turn on our borders and labels for reference. And the earthquakes are happening right across the Chalice Reserve Salmon Mountains. And this is the central point above the deepest part of the magma chamber for Yellowstone. Yellowstone starts at the surface here, where the magma chamber comes up to the surface. And it's like 90 miles circumference caldera. Well, going down 30 kilometers or more into the crust and at an angle, this 11 Grand canyon size magma chamber spreads all the way across to central Oregon, or, well, at least to central Idaho, and the feeder for it goes below central Oregon. So this is really like the center of it, right here, as it goes down and across Idaho, the deepest part of the center. And right above it, all the earthquakes, going up to the park itself. Then, like I said, an equal spacing of quakes going back up across the Craytown Edge. So really, if you look at it this way, Mount St. Helens, over to Yellowstone, over to the Craytown Edge, all displaced on a small basis, where the biggest of the bunch is happening above Yellowstone. Now back over here in Oregon, let's go see what's going on there at 2.1. West Port, Oregon. Now when I see an earthquake there, I get a little suspicious because there's just lack of reporting of seismic activity out of Oregon overall. I want to go see what's there. I'm also seeing hotspots marked today across Oregon. Okay, we're on a mountain road in the middle of nowhere. What is this? Clatsop State Forest. I have not never heard of it before. Now, I want to go check and see if there are any tremors taking place. So let's go see what the tremors are doing. Oh, wow. Okay, hey, hold on. As of yesterday, we have 72, and look where they are. Well, they're in northwest Oregon, with just a cluster down in central Oregon, and even smaller cluster in northern California. Let's go back to the 6th. 58, and look where they are. Northwest Oregon again. So each one of these has a magnitude assigned to it, but they're not earthquakes. They're vibrations as the plate is shifting. So wait a second. Vibrating in northwest Oregon... And then we get over here and we have an earthquake in northwest Oregon, which is pretty rare to even get one reported. Over to the east, Mount St. Helens is moving, and over to the east, Yellowstone's moving. Okay, so it's shifting still. Now, there's not thousands of tremors happening, but there are still in the 70 and 80 range. If I see it go down to, like, next to nothing, like 5 or 10, and it does that for several days, I would think that the slow slip is really slowing down. Right now, it's inching along. It hasn't fully slowed down yet. It was going in the hundreds per day, tallying up to thousands in the course of a week. That was when we were in our ETS, episodic tremor slip, just this past month in November. But now, it's getting down, getting down to the 50 and 70 range where it's not fully stopping. But as it's also not fully stopping, it's releasing some of that energy over to the east, hence the earthquakes following that path perfectly. Now, same time it's releasing over to the east, it's also releasing down to the south, and we can follow the red line map here from the USGS. So I just showed you our craton diagram and which way it flows over to Yellowstone 
and down the edge of the Craton, Montana, and so forth, coming out of the Northwest. But this is explained even by the red lines on the USGS map. The thick red line is the plate boundary. The thin red lines are all the marked faults. Look which way they go overall. At least along California's coast, over to the border, and even into Nevada. They all focus in here at the California-Nevada border. There's a super volcano there called Long Valley Super Volcano with 1,000 cubic kilometers of melt down below it. Now, they all go in the same direction, which is northwest to southeast. Look, we go all the way up here, and it kind of branches into the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. So, like a flowing river, this seismic force flows out from the area where there's tension, and it tries to equalize over to the edge of the craton and down the edge of the plate. And look what we have. Spreading in two directions, along California's coast and California's border, we reach out with the same sized earthquakes, going up into the two, maybe near 3.0 range. And the spots which are getting hit are pre-designated weak points that we can look for new activity to spread between. So for instance, when I say pre-designated weak points, there are spots where Mother Nature is already punched up through the plate with volcanism, and where humans have drilled in, from up above to get steam, as well as where humans have placed power generating stations of some kind that are generating major amounts of electricity, which is somehow having an earthquake effect. VLF, very low frequency, or ultra low frequency. Now the spots that we're zooming in here are drill points. These are pipelines and drill points where they inject water to get steam. The steam is then taken to the hilltops or up the hill to the turbines that are providing electrical power for the area. Those are all geothermal turbines on the edge of Clear Lake Volcanic Field, which itself is on the San Andreas, or right off of it, the Makama Fault Zone. And let me show you the Makama Fault Zone. Right here. The first red line interior to the thick red line. This is the crack in the plate that goes all the way through it, down to the underside of the plate, where there's magma. And then coming up next to where the red lines are, guess where all the volcanoes are? Out in the ocean, for instance. I can even show them to you on good old Google Earth. Every one of these red triangles is a different undersea volcanic segment. But a picture speaks a thousand words, right? So let's show you. How about a thousand volcanoes speaks how many words? <laughs> Look at all of them. Every one's a little crater, and this is mounted up thousands of feet on top of each other. And then you can see bigger cones, bigger undersea mounts, spatter cones, if you will, if you saw them on the surface. And the whole ridge is made up of them. Just thousands of small volcanoes piled on top of other volcanoes that form and break through and mound up. And it just goes on and on. You can see where it gets into a grainy imagery. But the tens of thousands of volcanoes that make up just this ridge, the Gorda Escarpment right here and the Mendocino Ridge. Now once you go across the fracture zone, you just have to zoom in again and you'll see the whole fracture zone is made up of undersea cone seamounts. And lines of them that are bigger that are going in a diagonal line. Look at that. Do you see that? Do you see how that diagonal line almost mi mimics that one? Almost. Now that diagonal line of volcanoes is matched up to the north. Look. They're all going in the same direction. Northwest to southeast. And they're littered throughout here, all going northwest to southeast, all the way up. Why? Let's go back to the north side that I was just showing you, all the way up here. All the undersea mounts are mimicking the direction of the cracks in the plate, and that's the way the force flows. And coming out of the southern arm of this, going down across California, we then get to the volcanoes. Hence, we are at that right there. Clear Lake. Okay. Up to the east by northeast we go to a 2.0 at Hamilton Branch, California. 2.1, 2.0. There's something over here next to Hamilton Branch. And let me get a sip of my coffee. Lake Almanor. But what's on the edge of Lake Almanor? Chester. Lassen Volcano, Strato Volcano. The huge Lassen Volcanic Center with all of its hundreds of other small volcanoes, which really aren't that small. I mean, some of these are huge. Red Cinder, Turnaround Butte, Ash Butte, Black Butte. Here's a young, here's Cinder Cone Butte State Park. Look at that one. 
Look at the lava flow off of it. Going down into the lake down to the south. Man, could you imagine if you could like row up to that, what that would look like? Just right down into the lake itself. Isn't that cool? Okay, huge lava flows all the way across there. And we're right on the edge of the volcanic field. That's where this little swarm is. So wait a second. Swarm here at a volcano. And swarm here at a volcano. With the biggest of the bunch, 3.0, coming in on the red line right at the pinnacle tip out in the ocean of the Juan de Fuca. Out here. So threes here. Twos over at the volcanoes here. Twos down to the volcanoes here. And then a spread of twos going down across the bay area on both sides of it. Then reaching down into central and southern California following the San Andreas. Arroyo Grande, California. I've got to look this up. Look, we don't normally see much activity roll down the San Andreas. It normally jumps over into the valley. So we're over here next to San Luis Obispo which is on the faults that connect down to the Elsinore. What's the name of the San Luis Obispo? Is this the San Luis Obispo Fault? What's this thing called? Cambria Fault? Oceanic Fault? Los Osos Fault? I mean, that's where we are. So, we're going down the faults along the San Andreas, but one thing I'd like you to notice, here's the San Andreas, the thick red line. The thin red lines are the faults next to the San Andreas. Why are we not going down the San Andreas itself? I propose to you that it takes less energy to move the faults, the smaller faults, than it does to move the whole San Andreas. Just like it takes less energy to move the pumping operations over on the east side into the valley over here where the green is, than it does to move the San Andreas. Which is why the San Andreas doesn't move much, and the areas around it do. Because it's easier to move the areas around the San Andreas than it is to move the San Andreas itself. Since those are just cracks in the plate around it, faults. And the San Andreas is a plate boundary. The thick red line is harder to move than the thin red lines around it. Pretty basic, right? Cracks in the plate are easier to move than a crack all the way through the plate. But energy follows down that red line. So the energy follows the thick red line easier than it does through the thin red lines. Isn't that amazing? Nonetheless, our earthquakes come in. Is there anything down there? I have to go look. So let's get the coordinates on this quake. Acquiring minds want to know what's over at Arroyo Grande besides the faults. Are there any other significant features nearby? Sometimes we find stuff, other times we don't. But the only way to find out is to look. Earthquake epicenter there, the location, Pozo, California. What is this? Mustang Water Slide Park. Well, what is this? That's it? A marina? A water slide park? <laughs> ah, can you imagine? Would you even feel it? You were on the water slide? Is there anything of any significance other than that, though? Because, again, I, I, if we're right on the fault, that's all the cause that we need to point to. If there's some kind of huge electrical generating station here or wind farm or oil pumping operation, that's why I'm looking. And once we find something, if we find something, we always mark it. But this looks pretty rural with no pumping operations nearby. Aurora Grande may be over to the west. We might have some pumping going on, but this right here... Nothing within miles. Farming. If you guys know of anything around here, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to write this into the fault zone itself, which getting back over to the fault zone map right here. So we have energy coming down, and it's going into L.A. What's going on over across over on the east side of California? So we're going to start, remember, up here we were at Chester, California, right next to Mount Lassen. And all those volcanoes up on the north side. We go over here and we're at a place called, called Pyramid Lake. It's actually triangulated from Sutcliffe, Nevada. But we'll put the coordinates in and go see what's there. One more time. What's up to the north up in Nevada? Pyramid Lake. On the edge of Pyramid Lake is a fumarole field. 
These are the needles at Pyramid Lake right here. Pillow lava formations. The fumaroles are there. Geysers, if you will. And then on the south side here, we have right down here in Reno, Steamboat Springs. And that's well known. That's marked by the Smithsonian. I would say the needles up at Pyramid Lake are less well known. And of course, Steamboat Springs, they build houses and geothermal turbines all over the side of this volcanic field. They're generating electricity and getting steam there to do that. Now on both sides of this, here I just showed you the geothermal turbines. Up here I showed you the fumarole field. In between the two, we have this giant oval shape, which itself is lined with volcanoes and gets hit with earthquakes all the way around the outside edge of it. On both sides, we have basins, Lake Tahoe to the south, a deep fold, and Pyramid Lake up to the north, also a deep fold. It goes down, let's see, 1,000 feet? Is that 1,000 feet deep? It goes 5,000 feet here, and 4,500 feet here, and in between the two, we're at 3,891. So it's like a 1,000 feet drop in between the two. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's what the elevation shows on Google Earth. So this giant oval shape in between the two basins, lined with volcanoes, hit with earthquakes around the outside edge, and in the middle, hot spots also appeared around the outside edge of this thing, and in the middle. Several hundred degrees. Fires even broke out with those hot spots, but first the hot spots appeared. I think it's the remnant caldera of an ancient supervolcano. That's my take on it. Down to the east by southeast, or just east of Lake Tahoe, let's just take you over here, just east by northeast, we get to Soda Lakes. And let's pull the coordinates on this so you can see how close we are. See how it says Silver Springs, Nevada? Well, we're going to another volcano, guys. So the volcanoes are weak points, pre-designated weak points that Mother Nature seeks out. Humans drill in from up above. It's a double perforation point. It's basically just drawing more seismic to the location. Here's Soda Lakes with the Smithsonian on it. But you'll see I have marked right up here. Geothermal, look at all these. There's solar, and here's geothermal. Side by side, steam and solar. They're not using, those are solar panels. They're not using that to reflect to create steam. That's, they're getting steam from the volcano right there. Black Butte Volcano is what they've drilled into the side of. Soda Lakes is the greater volcanic feature there. Okay, so let's just recap. Mount St. Helens, over to Yellowstone, to the edge of the Craton, line of quakes. Shifting in northwest Oregon, where we have an earthquake. Nothing else reported up to the north at all quiet. Down to the south, nothing reported across all of Oregon in the last day. But remember, we're shifting. It's shifting. There's vibrating going on. Not earthquakes, but vibrating from the plate. Once we get down into California, the volcanoes start to break and the drill points. So coming in on the Juan de Fuca fracture zone, 3.0. Going down to the volcano here at Clear Lake. Over to the volcano here at Mount Lassen. Over to the geysers and fumaroles at Pyramid Lake. Going over to Soda Lakes Volcano. That's where we are so far. I also covered down to the south a stepping stone path of small earthquakes going down the area next to San Luis Obispo, which is proof that the San Andreas is trying to shift, but there's just going to take a big push to do that. There's small earthquakes going around the San Andreas, indicating that the San Andreas is somewhat locked and loaded. Over on the east side, it all focuses in down here on the super volcano at the California-Nevada border. Over to Mono Lake, which somebody told me is called Mono Lake? Mona Lake? Momo Lake? Hey, I, 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 I'm not from there. Mono Lake. M-O-N-O. -O. Mono Lake. Mono Lake. And let me show them to you. They're side by side. The super volcano. And Mono Lake. Here's the caldera for the super volcano for Long Valley. It's lined with volcanoes, and it too gets hit with earthquakes around the outside edge and in the middle, and humans in the middle of this drilled in to get steam. So it's a double perforation point where humans drilled in from up above, Mother Nature is punched up from down below, and our earthquakes go around the outside edge. The rest go up here next to Mono Lake. There's the rising Pahoa Island out of the center. And we go across the border 
over into Nevada, and that's where the big bulk of activity is. And look at the line on this. So it's a somewhat east to west facing line of quakes, and it's been bigger in the past, but really, now we're encompassing the whole border region. I have to show you what's here on the north side. This is the new addition, the north side of this started to move. And there's something right next to this that I think you need to see. Two things, actually, next to this that I think you need to see. So, inquiring minds want to know, come along with me, everybody. Put on your sailor's hats. We're going on a voyage of discovery. See that? 5.7 and sworn from December 28, 2016. December big earthquake here from a few years ago. Right next to Aurora Bodhi Crater. Aurora Bodhi is the bigger feature. <laughs> right next to it, Mud Springs Volcanic Butte. And this is one of my more favorite features to show. Just looks cool. Look at that lava flow off of it. It's a 300 foot high, 2 to 300 foot high flow. So if you look at it from the side profile, rose up off the desert floor at least 200 feet. And you can imagine what that looked like when it flowed out in the past. Flowed out from here and flowed out down into the desert where it rippled out and it was a viscous thick flow of some kind. Aurora Bodhi blew in the past, and it too had some kind of viscous blast magma that came up with it. Those are both on the edge of Mono Lake. Now, remember what I mentioned? There's something else here nearby. Right over here, all of these are underground bunkers. Hawthorne Military Ammo Depot Storage Location. And we're right next to, look how many there are. Uh, anyway, we're right next to the volcanoes. Now, one other thing I'd like to show you, this ring of lacoliths here. Each one's a oval-like shape. Some are bigger than the others, but they make a ring themselves. Some of them have erupted in the past, or a fissure formed and magma came out and piled up. Again, this viscous-like flow that exists in these. Now, what I think happens here is magma intrudes into the plate, and it stays in there for a long time superheated and still liquid, but over time it becomes more viscous and almost hardens, and then a push comes in and pushes it up and breaks it out, and you get a viscous, thick magma up to the surface that flows out as a brief lava flow that piles up really quick because it's not that viscous. Or not that liquid. It's more viscous. Thicker. Anyway, we have a line of earthquakes that goes all the way around from the supervolcano to Mono Lake over to Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center back up to Mud Springs and Aurora Bodhi Crater. Let's carry on. Down to the south, we get into the Owens Valley. And there's a bulk of earthquakes going from Mono Lake, or Mono Lake, going from Kozo Junction all the way down to the Lava Mountains. On the north side, though, there's one lone quake up here in the bend of the valley. And the bend of the valley, there's something there. It's like a distillation pond. Let me show it to you. So this is like a Death Valley type scenario where it's so dry they can have evaporation ponds and evaporate out the water. Almost like the Dead Sea almost. And they get the different minerals out of the water there, I guess. But we're right next to something else. This. This oval shape is a little harder to see. Wait, hold on, everybody, hold on. Everybody put on the brakes. we got a hot spot right there. Today, right now, today, December 8, 2020, hot spot there. In California now, over in the east side of the valley, right next to those things that I showed you before, these round lacoliths that I showed you. For instance, this. This is just one of them. This is in the eastern valley, a bulge in the plate. Here's another one up here to the north. Let me find it. Right here. This ring-like shape. This is a bulge that actually goes up to the center. <clears throat> okay, uh, hold on one second, guys. Okay, just had to clear my throat. Let me get a sip of my coffee. So, a new hotspot. Well, put on the brakes, everyone. We have to go look up the hotspots now. Dang. This is where we just get into the super long update. As if it wasn't already long enough. Let's go look. Let's go see what's going on down in Southern California. First of all, we got a counterclockwise rotating low pressure system out here. It looks like it's got some smoke in it or something. Hold on. 
What? Where's the smoke coming from? Let's go look at a regional view. Okay, it's cut off on the north side. What, what, what are we doing here? What is this tomfoolery? It's regional sector. Okay. Where's that smoke coming from? Dude, huge fire on the south of the border. Oh my god, what the hell? What? Where did that come from? Hold on. A huge fire down in Mexico. Massive. Dude, you can see it right here. Let's get the uh, shortwave turned on and go down to a localized sector. Yeah, wow. Here it is last night. Look at that. That's just thousands and thousands of acres all burning at once. Wow. That's where the smoke came from. Okay, well, I didn't hear anybody talking about the massive fires that broke out down there. Now that we know that there were major fires there, that's the third set of major fires down in the region in the past two days. Well, no, four days. But we have a new hotspot appearing up here in the valley up here, which I can't really see much on. Let's go up into the valley and take a look. Localized sector view. We're going to look down here into California. We're looking in the central, central eastern part of the valley down here for a hot spot. It's covered in clouds right now. All right, let's go back over and take a look on Google Earth. Here's the hot spot. Here's the location in California. The Mexican location down here is this. Now I have to bring up what we're next to. We're next to this giant oval shape that I showed you in our last two updates. I showed you this, I showed you this, and I showed you... Are those the two that I showed you? I thought I showed you a third one. Oh yeah, I showed you this one right here. So this one, this one, and this one. I showed you these three circular bulges in the plate and described and told you about lacoliths a couple days ago. Now, next to it, over here, next to the bulge in the plate, we get a huge, just massive, sudden outbreak of fire that is enough to put smoke on the satellite out in the ocean. Uh, uh, but what is that? 500 miles out into the ocean? Let's get another view on the natural color fire view. There's the smoke from it. Leading edge on it. Amazing. Okay, now that that's covered, let's go look and see if we have any other hotspots showing up. I mean, if there's one, there's more. Let's go up into Northern California and go take a look. Okay, so right now it's 1 o'clock West Coast time, 1.40 West Coast time, and it looks like we have a few of these still going on across Northern Valley of California where the shifting's taking place. There are. There's a few flickering on and off. Now, I want to go up north even further. Let's go up into Oregon, where it's somewhat clear. Oh, wow. Hold on. Hold on. Oregon is just littered with hot spots. Look at how many there are. So, we have one here, three here, another there, 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 and it's only in Oregon. It's where the plate is shifting. Let's zoom in on a closer view. Southwest Oregon, for instance. So every one of these little blacked out... Oh, look, there's one right along the coast. Right along the coast there. Let's go and see if it's on Google Earth yet. Oh, yeah, it is. Look at that. Right along the coast. What is this place? Oh, my goodness gracious. Look what's there. A giant electrical generating, generating station? Or is that a substation? Let's turn off this. Hold on. Oh, dude, look at the size of that electrical station. So that's a substation, but look where it's, I mean, it's got all the towers coming out right next to it. That is where the hotspot is. So you're having some kind of electrical discharge that's affecting the area. Let's go down here and take a look. There's two other hotspots. Let's go see what's at these locations. There might not be anything there at all. See, I think the plate is releasing electrical energy. Or maybe the grid is. Now, the solar that's going on is a big deal. 
The solar is a big deal because with a solar storm, who knows what that's going to be doing. Government Ranger Station. Sanctuary One, what is this? Oh, hey, look what we've got. A giant dam. A major dam there. Now, are they doing any kind of electrical out of there? You think they would be, right? What dam doesn't, right? What what dam with a flow like that doesn't, I mean? Is it just a reservoir? This, to me, looks like where they would do any kind of electrical, but I don't see any big power lines coming out from there or anything. So, that to me says maybe they're not. Let's go down here on the south side, see if they're doing anything down here. No, that's where the flow's coming in. Okay, well, no electrical generating there, at least just not as far as I can see. Let's go over to the east because we've got more hotspots. What's at this location? If we have another dam there, I'll be surprised. This looks pretty arid and pretty rural. What is that? Winema National Forest. Winema? Oh, wait. The Sprague River Valley. How big is this? Let's just see if that's small or... It doesn't say. <laughs> doesn't say how big the Sprague River Valley zone is. I don't see anything of any significance out here. Not even really any electrical lines. People try to tell me that electrical lines are everywhere. I'm like, oh yeah, well what about here? They're not right there, are they? Oh wait, oh, I spoke too soon. I spoke too soon. We have a giant clear cut for four sets of huge high voltage towers. It's not just like one, it's like the biggest artery for the entire state. Look at that, it goes across whole county lines. It's just one set that connects into two sets. Look, we can go through multiple counties and trace it across the whole state. It's, wow, man, I'm glad I checked. What about over to the east then? What about these? Going down in the valley and up into the mountains. So you can't tell me it's farmers burning their fields when we're on the edge of a mountain cliff. Wait, this is a giant ring. Look at this. Hold on. Do you see this? This is rising. This goes from 6,300 feet to 6,800 feet. What is this called? Drake Peak. Don't recall ever having to hear anything about that before. What's down here in the valley? A reservoir. Okay, we have a reservoir there. Nothing else there. Right? I mean, it's not even, like, very well forested, even. I mean, there are some old pinion pine trees. Oh, boy. Okay, is there anything else? I just got to verify. All right, I don't see anything else. I've got to check every one of these locations now. This is going to just take forever. And I don't know if I want to do this live, because, again, there's a lot of locations where there's nothing at the location at all, which to me says that a hotspot popping up in the middle of nowhere where there's no human activity even around says to me it's probably plate release. Now, it could be electric, like earthquake lights, the solar storm that's taking place starting tomorrow, the 9th, the 10th, it's supposed to get fairly intense. Level G3. Could bring Aurora as far south as Oregon, which is where we are now. Aurora Borealis can be forming across Oregon, Iowa, Pennsylvania. That's how far south the aurora could come down in this solar storm that's coming in in the next few days. Okay, so let's recap. We have earthquakes going down the coast, following the San Andreas, but not on the San Andreas directly, going on the faults on either side. San Andreas is still stuck. Once we get up here to the north, we're at the volcanoes. We branch off and go around down to the volcanoes at the California-Nevada border. And then we go down to Cozo Junction, Ridgecrest, and Lava Mountains, which I really haven't even shown you yet. But once we get to the further south, we're at the L.A. Basin. This time we're out in the ocean. And we're going along the Elsinore Fault right alongside where the San Andreas Fault is. The number of earthquakes in Southern California has dropped off big time. The frequency has gone down. 
when a frequency goes up, we get more earthquakes. Obviously, the higher frequency, the more number of earthquakes. And so the number of earthquakes is low. The magnitudes behind them also low. But the flow is clearly coming in from the north, which means it's going to increase. Once it dead ends down here into Southern California, I would think we need to warn the LA Basin right now for 4.0 range plus activity to come rolling in the next day. By, like tomorrow into the 10th. So let, let's put it at 48 hours. 48 hour warning for LA to be on the 4.0 range or greater activity as fours already came in up north. There's already been two fours. There was a four up north and a four down south. Now the middle point should move and it's pretty obvious something's moving right now in the middle. Again, it's coming down next to the San Andreas here, and it's picking up down to the south here, and then right south of the border, poof, huge fire breaks out. As well as hot spots across Oregon. What about over to the east? Let's just quickly take a look over into Utah. Let's go pull both earthquakes in central and southwest Utah. This earthquake in southwest Utah is bringing us in next to the Markagunt Plateau. It's another volcanic field. And I've looked this up so many times in the past. I had to memorize, but let's just show you. Okay, here we are. Markagunt Plateau, unmarked crater knoll volcano. Unmarked, no Smithsonian on it. But the Markagunt Right down here on the south side. You see that? And, I mean, you could say technically we're on the north side of that a little far. That we're right next to Mineral Mountains Cove Fort Volcanic Field 2. But I think Mineral Mountains Cove Fort is just tied into Mark Agun. Personally, that's just my own take on it. Basalt Fisher right here I marked myself. Black Basalt. Apparently that ruptured at some point in the past. That's a lava flow. Happened several times in the past too. Look at the... Number of times that's flowed on top of each other. A long, long time ago. Crater Knoll and Cinder Crater. Mineral Mountains Co. Fort is the Smithsonian for it. Okay. That's where the earthquake is. Pretty obvious. Volcano. What about up here? Central Eastern. So let's go look it up. Central Eastern Utah, I mean. I, didn't, I need to finish my statement. Central Eastern what? Up to the Central East. Okay, here we are. Now, there's something of interest here, too. So take a look. See the bend in the plate here? But look, it looks like water erosion, doesn't it? It is. It's from the ancient inland ocean that used to be here forever ago that drained out in segments over a long period of time. This was all an ocean drained out through the Grand Canyon. Hey, that may have been what formed the Grand Canyon. It wasn't the Colorado River after all. Yeah. That's the ticket. <laughs> I don't know, but I am here to tell you this ancient inland ocean went somewhere other than evaporation. And right on the edge of this, look where the earthquake is and look what we're parallel to. We are parallel to where our oil pumping operations start just with a few jacks and pumps here. So a few jacks and pumps go into dozens of jacks and pumps as we go up here to the north that turn into hundreds of jacks and pumps that then turn into thousands of jacks and pumps that spread across the mountain ranges. And I'm not against oil and gas, but when you see the size of this, what do you see? I'm not done. Thousands go across over to here. I don't know if you see them at this level. Let me zoom in to make them a little bit more identifiable. All these little square pads in the mountains... This one has two different drill points and two sets of tanks and two pipelines at it. But you get the picture how many there are. And then we get out of the mountains and we go into the fields. And it becomes grid-like in shape from the distance that we're looking at this high up. Where every one of these is a different oil well. I'm just randomly zooming in on them. And we go down here and it goes into overdrive. Where they look like sand dunes on the ground but every little spot is a different well. And it's just on and on for miles and miles in all directions, through the mountains, through the fields, over the hills, through the woods. To Frack Mother's house we go. 
And we go back now. We're going back towards where the earthquake is. Across the valley, right down here on the edge of Carbon County. And that's where the earthquake comes in, on the north tip of the valley that meets up with all the spot that's drilled. All of that that I just showed you. From here, up, across, over, over, back, down, and around is all drilled. Hundreds of thousands of times across the whole area. Weak points in the plate that get hit as energy transfers out across it. Are you shocked? So the only other earthquakes I would have to look up are up here at Salt Lake City. And we're on both sides of Salt Lake City. But there's something at each location on the south tip of Salt Lake down here. Right down here, the earthquakes are coming in at Magna, Utah. The tailing ponds on the north side and on the south side, Thiokol, Bunkers, ATK Orbital Systems Bunker Facility, and the BP Mining Facility. That's where the earthquakes come in, right here where the 1.3 is. So there's only really one that I need to look up that I don't know actually what's there. And I think this is on the Wasatch Fault itself. It's like the only actual fault zone earthquake that we've got. The rest are actually at the bunkers, the drill points. Yeah, it is. It's right on the edge of the Wasatch, southeast, southwest of Bear Lake. Okay, so that's a good summary, isn't it? So what about the rest? Let's go down into Texas, where the stars at night are big and bright. <laughs> Wait, it's triangulated from New Mexico. What kind of shenanigans is this? Are these? So we're at the New Mexico border, but this is clearly in Texas. And it's many miles over on the Texas side of the border. This is two days in a row where we're having the earthquakes listed out of New Mexico, even though they are in Texas. So that just gets confusing for people if they want to go look it up and try and figure out what's there. Let's go see. Texas now. What's in Texas? Oh, wait. What are all these right here out in the desert? All these little pads. They're all oil and gas pumping operations. Now that's just an old pond, but at the center you see the little square the drill point. Now, next to it, we've got a pipeline and stations where they combine the oil and gas into pipelines. Here's a dry pond. They fill these with water. So when it rains, they want this to fill up. Then they pull the water, mix it with chemicals, and pump it down into the ground to break apart the shale and the fracking. And all of these are different oil wells. So this is actually like next to nothing. How many are you think are there? Like 100, maybe? Maybe 100 drill points right across there. That's nothing. Now, over here, we get into the thousands of drill points. All oil and gas again. Now, this is Texas, of course. And we go from thousands to tens of thousands. And here's a town, for instance. Here's what a town looks like. And look what's around town. And we go from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And by that point, we're at millions of drill points all the way around the area. When you, when you see, every county has been done like this through Texas. And some of them go into what I call excessive overdrive. So here's the town of Crane. And right next to Crane, here's our oil patches. When you drill this many times on the edge of the Craton, it stands to be vulnerable to power. Excuse me. Sorry again, guys. I had to clear. <laughs> another little throat clearing event going on here. Oh, that's wonderful. Let's turn off the Craton graphic before we forget that it's on. So over to the west, that's where the earthquake struck, right at the edge of the Craton, right where the drill points start. And they have it listed out of New Mexico for some weird reason. So the only other earthquake I really want to talk about is the Kansas earthquake that struck. Now, I issued a warning for Kansas this week. That's right. Issued the warning for Kansas. So I said Kansas-Oklahoma border or Oklahoma-Kansas border region. That's where to watch. And our warning was going up to 4.0. And it came in at 3 to 3.3. So it's within the magnitude. At 3.0 even, it's within the magnitude. Look where we are, though. We're in Kansas. Ah, the Bel Air. Oh my goodness. Wichita, Kansas, Bel Air. Oh man, how I became the Dutch of Bel Air. 
So we're in Kansas and we're next to a few things. How about McConnell Air Force Base? We're at the Air Force Base. And look what we have at McConnell. It's legit. This is legit. This isn't some out of use Air Force Base. This is the real McCoy. And we are also on the north side of our big pumping that goes at least as far north as here. Pumping, oil and gas. Now this is just where I stopped marking the earthquakes. We could go in and, or stop marking the wells. We could probably find more up here to the north on the north side of town, on the north side. Now that's just a guess. What is this place? Colonel James Jabarta Airport. Never heard of it. But I would look, I really would, start looking for oil and gas pumping operations here on the north side of town, up by Bel Air. Because likely there are some. And, and if there aren't, I'm not too, I wouldn't be shocked either, but I would think that there are. What do we have here? Oh, big time electrical. Of course. Of course we have big time electrical there. What about next to the earthquake? Let's see. Are we at an electrical generating station of some kind? Look at the shopping. Whoa, dude. Holy cow. Look at the size of these houses. Are you kidding me? My God. Hey, time for me to do a fundraiser. Should I just do a fundraiser to buy a mansion? <laughs> and then to pay for the taxes for the rest of life because I could never afford to even pay the taxes on some house like this? You got to be kidding me. Do they go street level on this? Ah, oh, of course not. Private subdivision. Let's see if we get a back view on the mansion. Across the golf. Their backyard's like a golf course. Nope. I say, old boy, you can't even see our house from the shopping center. I bet they were pissed when they built the shopping center right behind him. Okay. Let's carry, <laughs> let's carry on. We're on the edge of the airport, which is the McConnell Air Force Base. We're on the north side of a huge set of pumping operations that I think extends to the north, but can't prove it. Is there anything else of any significance? Well, just to seal the deal, we got our railroad track there also. What are we, where's the hot spot? We need a hot spot to appear there next. That's the only thing missing. So we issued the warning for Kansas. Kansas has been hit. We issued it for 4.0, came in at 3. And I don't know if it actually went higher than 3. Again, 3.3 was the highest I think that we heard about. But let's go look at the local magnitude list and see what it shows. We'll throw out the high end and we'll throw out the low end. So on the low end, I'm seeing 3 and 3.1. Look at that. Low end, I'm seeing 3 and 3.1. High end, I'm seeing 3.5 and 3.6. My good, a 3.9 is the highest on the list. Man, oh, dude, they did that again? See, this is what I'm talking about. I started talking about this at the start of the update, a world away, where they did this with the earthquake over in Philippines. They took it down by a full magnitude. I issued a warning for a 6.5 earthquake, or 6.4 or greater to hit, and a 6.4 hit. And they downgrade it to a 5.4. Just to hide it. To make me incorrect. You know what I mean? And then over here, we issued a warning for a 4 and a 3.9 hits. Well, we throw that out even. 3.5 hits and they downgrade it by a full magnitude. Something's up. Something's up with that. That's too weird. It's happened too many times in the past. All right. Hawaii. Aloha, everyone. Ah, uh, you had to listen to the whole thing about the rest of the dang planet just to get to Hawaii. I'm sorry, guys. It, priorities, man. So, here we are. Let's zoom in on the earthquakes. Another 4.0 range earthquake struck today in the last day. Let's get all the others out of there. Looky, looky here. A 4.1 earthquake. Why does that matter? Well, for my... First of all, hold on, hold on. The Europeans have it at 4.1. What does the USGS have it at? The USGS doesn't have a 4.0 earthquake at all. USGS last earthquake is a 3.3. Ha! Well, okay. It's a 4. You got a 4. Europeans are reporting it. They're telling us to go to the USGS to get the info. That's funny. Go get the info from the USGS. It says 4. And then we go to the USGS. It says 3.3. Look where it is. Look where your new 4 struck. It's at Kilauea. 
A couple days ago, over here on the northwest side or flank of Mauna Loa, that's where the other 4.1 earthquake struck. So now that's two 4.1s. USGS doing some crazy, whatever. 4.1 and 4.1. Middle East Rift Zone and Mauna Loa. They're side by side. Let's bring it in and look at it at an angle. So coming in down along the coast of Hawaii and looking up there, now you can see the bulge of Mauna Loa and you can see the depression of Kilauea at the base of Mauna Loa. And then out here at the base of Kilauea, we have Loihi. So it's like a stair step of volcanoes where one is up above the other. And this is the spot that's reinflating. So it's reinflating. We have a line of earthquakes that goes around the outside edge of the whole Middle East rift zone that happened this past week, prompting me to get on and talk about it. And now you have a triangle of quakes. 4.1 earthquake up here at Kilauea. 4.1 earthquake over here on the side of Mauna Loa. And a swarm down there along the coast. If you take these three and combine, if just draw a line around all three, look where it takes us. A line around all three. From down along the coast, up to Kilauea, over to Mauna Loa. Look, it's on the edge of the Middle East rift zone. This thing's reinflating. It's displacing Mauna Loa, and it's displacing out along the edge of Loihi. So if anything's going to happen, I think it's going to happen along the edge where they meet. That's probably why Kilauea is the place where it is now. That's where the previous point where the magma chambers met before, before this whole thing collapsed. Now it's been a year and a half, almost two years, and we're just now seeing it start to reinflate to a point where there's major seismic going on. Not major. Noteworthy seismic going on. It could get a lot bigger. And it will. And that's going to be our warning sign. So, the seismic's going to increase here, but why? It's on the fracture zones, east and west facing fracture zone. Look where the Hawaiian island chain is. Look where it goes. Goes back up to the northwest, meets up, goes up to the northwest even further, meets up with Kamchatka. But the Hawaiian island chain branches off and goes out here in between our two fracture zones, east and west facing. Going from the Hawaiian island chain down to the south is another series of undersea mounts that makes a line, that makes a crescent shape, and curls around and goes into South America at the coast of South Peru. So this line of undersea mounts goes back up and meets up with the Hawaiian island chain. And Hawaii sits out there in the middle in between these two fracture zones. But we can trace the fracture zone back. It goes back to our arrows, American Samoa, where the hammering action comes in. The big deep earthquakes down below here that I started out the whole update talking about. So we have to recap the whole planet now to understand why Hawaii is getting it, which is why I go to Hawaii last in the whole update. Hammering action comes in here. Hammering action comes in here where our letter Ds are. And here at Japan. Comes up from below here. Spreads out and across. Once it gets to the undersea mount chain here, it spreads out across our fracture zones. Follows our two arrows to the south. And goes out to the middle. That's why you get a big increase in Hawaii when you get a big push coming in from here, here, and here. They're all connected. The undersea mount chain connects in Hawaii like a plug-in. And the increase takes place. Look, go back to 2018. 2018, we had our big, deep 8.0 earthquake that happened here. We also saw a bunch of volcanic activity all the way across Indonesia, Philippines, Japan, Kamchatka, and Alaska. The same day that Hawaii blew with its 7.0 earthquake and big lava flow here from Kilauea, the same day, ma, ma, ha, hum, ha, hum, <coughs> Luke, 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 use, use the force. Okay, uh, no, I don't have COVID. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, we're done. We're done. Aloha. Let's get on out of here. Let's hightail it on back to the where we started the whole update. 
which is the deep earthquakes guys our big deep earthquakes are what's causing the major activity so the big ac activity increase 250,000 foot high blast this past week spread of fives going up to Japan oh wait hold on new earthquake is that a new earthquake at the coast of Japan oh yeah look at that well a new earthquake has struck right here at the juncture where the plate boundaries come together on the coast of Japan let's go back over and just wrap this up let's go back to the red line map that I showed throughout the whole update go over to Japan new earthquake right here right where the H shape bend of the plate is we have energy coming up from the south and it's trying to spread out across up to the north it's only in the mid-range four level but let's find our halfway points between our current earthquakes look where the rings overlap here look at 48 hours worth of earthquakes look where our rings overlap so one set of rings overlaps here on the Izu Ridge obviously we're dealing with a lot of seismic activity and all the rings overlap there up to the north the rings overlap on the coast of Honshu so two spots are going to get hit off this coast of Honshu and back behind it down to the south where the rings overlap on the Izu Ridge third spot where the rings overlap Okinawa northeast of Taiwan south of Japan right in the middle of it the little island of Okinawa all three are going to get hit by something bigger than what's on both sides right now and what's on both sides fives something bigger than that low end five okay if anything else goes on I will jump back on at a moment's notice let's just go again check and make sure nothing else has hit in the last hour since doing my update this is seismic go time with the solar now the solar oh yeah that's the final point on this everyone hold on let's go over and see if I do I think I deleted it I'm pretty sure I deleted it but I can look it up right now Enlil spiral NASA WSA Enlil solar wind prediction is this going to show it uh let's see WSA Enlil let's hit play there we go that is the new coronal mass ejection CME bursting from the Sun with solar flare as well but the CME is pretty big and it's a solar storm watch going up to level G3 which G1 is minor G2 is getting somewhat noteworthy G3 is considered strong it can go up as high I think I don't I, I, I'm, I don't cover solar guys I think it goes up to G5 doesn't it I don't know 5g huh. maybe it goes up even further or less maybe it's g4 but the point is major strong solar storm you can see it burst out now we're looking at a 90 degree angle from earth okay you get obviously you see where we are so Sun is at the center and that's gonna be here by the 10th and according to the professionals now let's go over and see their little warning they put out here we are the space weather prediction center this is today's warning from December 8th December 9th minor December 10th strong December 11th moderate G2 and what can happen off that like I said Aurora may be seen as low as Pennsylvania Iowa and Oregon radio high frequency radio may be intermittent navigation intermittent satellite navigation GPS problems including loss of lock and increased range error may occur spacecraft may have problems but we don't really have to worry about that much induced currents power system voltage irregularities possible false alarms may be triggered on some protection devices area of impact primarily pole word of 50 degrees geomagnetic latitude so basically 50 degrees and further north but it could come down as far as Iowa and Pennsylvania and that then tells me guys we're going to be going through major seismic activity in the next several days we're going to see a big increase it's already been 
talked about in many studies. So this isn't my take on it. I'm just repeating to you what the studies said and what the whole controversy was for many years, which was, is there a relation between the sun and earthquakes? Solar events and earthquakes. And I think we can pretty much say that there is. I mean, it's not just me. I mean, is observers wrong too? Is everybody wrong and the eggheads previously right? It just doesn't make sense. So we've seen an increase in the past when seismic activity increases along with that incoming solar. Now that a big solar storm is coming and is due here strong by the 10th, today is the 8th. That means tomorrow it starts. And I would look for several days after the solar storm arrives for that power to convert from up in the ionosphere with the air glow of the northern lights for all that electrical discharge to go down into the core of the earth which then will we'll see a bunch of deep earthquake activity and shallow large earthquake activity and rare earthquakes in spots we don't normally see so like you remember when michigan got hit that one time next to the nuclear plant you remember when virginia got hit next to its nuclear plant well, both of those nuclear plant earthquakes happened at a time where we were having major solar storms. From Earth-directed CMEs, where, which send charged particles, physical charged particles, take two to three days to arrive to Earth. The light, only the photons of light, only take a few minutes. The charged particles take days. There's physical ejecta with that that comes and bombards Earth. Then the seismic increase takes place. Same with solar wind. Strong solar wind comes from a coronal hole. It doesn't come here instantly. The solar wind takes two to three days to arrive here. So if you have a coronal hole turning towards Earth, wait two to three days, and that's when the arrival really starts to take place. And that's when your strong solar wind starts to flare up. Like two to three days after you see that coronal hole start to point towards Earth. So anyway, you want to get that info, go over to the solar channels. They got that covered. I'm not trying to step on their game at all. I'm the last person to bring you the info, not the first on solar. But seismically speaking, I got to talk about it so you know what to expect in the next few days. Don't be surprised when we're dealing with 7.0 plus activity popping off around the plate all of a sudden. And oh, by the way, the professionals will weigh in once it starts to become noticeable to the point where the general population notices. They'll say, oh, it's not related. Oh, there's no increase. And they'll really try to ham it up to play it down seen this happen so many times in the past all right have an earthquake plan please will you take the time to at least develop a plan to know what to do when an earthquake strikes take shelter underneath a table or a desk basic but you should also have an emergency kit that gets you through a few days in case you're cut off without food power water you also need medications if you require them sanitation especially special now right and you'll think of way better things, a way to charge your mobile phone, a, a way to uh, get in touch with people, maybe even, that's not related to the cellular world or the mobile phone world. If you have children, think of them. They might need a few things to distract them during that time while all the adults are going through something that they likely never have been through before. Big earthquake. I'll be back on if anything else goes down, okay? And we will save this. We're going to save it as a video. We'll go upload it over on YouTube. Hey, Dutch Sense, go check the buoys. Check the buoys. What? Check the buoys? Now, why would we need to do that? Hold on. BC. National Data. Buoy Center. Well, looks like we're not done yet. Let's go look it up. See what's going on. National Data Buoy Center. Oh, wow. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> All right, what's going on out here? We'll kind of, okay, we got the tiniest little thing. Tiny. Itsy bitsy teeny weeny little variation on something. So you can't tell me it's a storm wave, guys. We're talking about the difference of 2739.78 meters and 2739.8 meters so what's the difference between 0.78 and 0.8 0 0.02 meters is it totally still ocean out there right now it's got to be to not have any variation like that look at this the the variation is less than a meter no not no less than an inch i mean 
it must just be dead still out there right now. Again, look at the variation. That tells us. The variation is like a tenth of an inch. Wait, or a, a tenth... One thousandth of a meter. What does that even come A centimeter? That's a hundred. So it's nothing. But why is it in event mode then? What about the other one? Okay, this one's at the height of a regular tide. You, you can see the normal tidal flow, right? The tidal in and out on that. So the variation tide-wise goes up by two meters and down six feet, up and down by six feet over the course of days. But this looks like this. So it goes up to the top. 32, 71, 41 meters, and then drops down to 30. 271.37 meters. So again, it's dropping 0 0.3 meters. 0 0.3. Like next to nothing, but it drops and it records it as an event mode dropping. What the heck? Let's go put the coordinates in and just see where it's dropping. Because both of them are dropping slightly. Let's just see why. Both drop at once slightly. Google Earth, coming back. Learning something new, too. And this is in the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone, man. That's where this is. I mean, there's no doubt about that. We are in the Juan de Fuca. But where? Wow. Look where we are. We're right next to that line of volcanoes that I used in my example when I was showing the west portion of the Fracture Zone here. I mean, we're right there. The North Gorder Ridge segment and President Jackson Seamount. This is the President Jackson Seamount made up of several undersea volcanoes, smaller and larger. Undersea mounts, that is. And they connect back up in a line up here to the Blanco Fracture Zone. So really, it just comes off and goes down this way. It's like a new fracture zone. Newer than the actual plate boundary. So, wow, okay, well, what, man, you know, what can I say? The southern arm of the Juan de Fuca is dropping slightly by a few centimeters or whatever. And it's being picked up on the buoys. That's what's going on. It's just why. And we know something else is going on. Hold on, hold on. There's something else going on here. Let's go to the tremor map again. So we're off the shore of Oregon right here. Correct? That's where we are with the buoys that are in event mode on the southern arm of the Juan de Fuca, which is that arrow shape. And Oregon is shifting on land with all the little red dots. So getting back to the USGS plate boundary map now, we are out here with the buoys. We are shifting on land here. Our earthquakes are coming in down through California, down to the south. And our push is coming in from the north with no earthquake activity reported out of the coast, which is getting very, very suspect at this point that they are hiding earthquakes, deliberately probably not reporting them at this point. Are there any other buoys in event mode? You know what? Before I shut off the screen capture, hold on. Before I shut off the screen capture, let's go back and see if there's any more. You know, again, two off the whole Pacific in event mode. And the spot where they are, I mean, come on, look at it again. So, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait. One is on the southern side. One is on the northern side of this. The Blanco Fracture Zone. Huh. All the hot spots across Oregon, too, cannot be ignored. So, Oregon's got the tremors. Oregon's got the hot spots. Oregon's got two event mode buoys going on but no earthquakes of any significance. Instead, it's going to all the volcanoes on both sides and all sides of it. That's what's going on right now as we're covering this. That's amazing. I'm glad that somebody reported that to me in chat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who reported that to me in chat. I think this is a good point for me to end it, though. We'll save this as a video now and get it out over on YouTube for everybody to watch back. Look, I'm going to just go... <laughs> when we see... Buoys going into event mode. I don't care what the explanation is. It's off the coast of Oregon, of all the places. 
We see that happening in conjunction with the hotspots, in conjunction with the deep earthquakes, in conjunction with the solar storm, in conjunction with the previous deep earthquake, and the possibility of large earthquake activity. The spread of the same sized earthquakes across the whole planet. The USGS ignoring a 4.7 over in Europe, in Gibraltar. It's going by on the right hand side of the screen right now. We have to go to the Europeans to get a 4.7? Wow. So it's a big deal what's going on. Please be ready, and I'll be back if anything else goes down. Look out for this as a video over on YouTube in like 30 to 45 minutes. We'll premiere it back, and I'll be over there and chat with you. Peace out, guys. Be safe. Remember, don't be scared. You need to be prepared. You need to watch this. Don't be shocked as we go into big earthquake activity with this solar event that's coming in in the next day. And it usually takes a day or two. So it takes a day or two for the time for the solar storm to emit the charge of particles coming towards Earth. Then it bombards Earth by the time it gets here, two to three days later. Then, two to three days after that, big seismic, or less, sometimes right as it's hitting, other times right after it hits. So it's a, usually about a week between the time where the solar takes place to the time where it arrives and has a major effect. Even though they say two to three days for arrival, there's a conversion time after that that takes place as well. But we've all noticed it's not just me. So within a few days after the solar storm, boom, all of a sudden, huge earthquakes. And multiples too, not just one. Anyway, alright guys, much love. Peace out.